a city divided, a family fractured, two brothers caught between past and present. Published by Knopf Books for Young Readers, Berliners, a new novel by National Book Award nominee Vesper Stamper, is a riveting story about the rivalry between two brothers living on opposite sides of the Berlin Wall during its construction in the 1960s, and how their complicated legacy and dreams of greatness will determine their ultimate fate. This powerfully prescient and haunting book is a perfect gift for young readers and has a lot to offer to grown-ups as well. But then again, I am biased, as yours truly had the honor and the pleasure of narrating the audio version of this wonderful novel. So please, support free-thinking, independent artists, and purchase Berliners by Vesper Stamper from your favorite bookseller today. Make sure to check out the link in the show notes below. Hello there, you beautiful people. I've got a question for you. Do you drink coffee or tea? Of course you do, you beautiful bastard. And that is precisely why I want to tell you about my sponsor, Twin Engine Coffee. Twin Engine Coffee grows and roasts specialty-grade coffees right on the farms in Central America. And guess what? If you happen to be a snob like me and are much too pretentious to drink coffee, you can enjoy some Keturah tea, my personal favorite, which is made from the dried fruit of the coffee plant. You take you some ginger root, a couple lemon slices, some honey, and a dash of cayenne powder, and you'll have an even sexier concoction than all the hipsters tapping away at their laptops at that high-end cafe around the corner. So again, if you enjoy great coffee or tea, support small business and this podcast by ordering from TwinEngineCoffee.com slash Clifton Duncan. Again, that is TwinEngineCoffee.com slash Clifton Duncan. There's a link in the show notes below. And now, enjoy the show. I think the arts are more important than anything, but I think that they are, first of all, they're a tremendous risk. I mean, it's a, a real, really risky way to live. Um, and, and also, it's a little hard to define like everything else that matters like love like god like the spirit like all those things you have to live it you have to do it and you have to experience it to know how much it matters but when you meet people who truly love the arts there's something about them uh, that's like just lit it's just a little candle inside them uh you know and and um and I, it, you understand then that this is a beautiful thing the truth really is beauty and beauty really is truth and who was it was it Solzhenitsyn who said beauty will save the world or Dostoevsky maybe Be Dostoevsky I think said beauty will save the world if anything saves the world it will be beauty gentlemen and as always everyone in between my name is clifton duncan you have found the clifton duncan podcast thanks for coming again uh please if you're watching this on youtube make sure to like comment share and subscribe i think i did that in all the right uh, in the right order um if you're consuming on spotify make sure to leave a, a nice little review there we have nothing but five star reviews right now i don't know what you people are doing but i'm not even paying you it's pretty great um but uh, either way if you love it please share it with your friends and as always if you hate it why then share it with your enemies um, today, I have a uh, lovely, lovely guest who's a, a very, very smart individual who's uh, been around for some time, and I think we're going to have a very, uh, maybe an uncomfortable, uh, uncomfortably personal conversation, uh, which is unusual for the podcast, but uh, we'll get to that later. That's called a, what is it called, a lead-in, a foreshadowing, whatever it is. You're the, you're the, you're the literary guy. Um, but uh, why don't you introduce yourself, Mr. Oops, I'm not going to take away your thunder. I'm, I am Andrew Clavin, host of the Andrew Clavin Show on the Daily Wire, and uh, it's good to see you again, Clavin. Likewise, Mr. Clavin. Uh, it's uh, it's always a pleasure connecting uh, with someone of of uh, of your wit and experience. I have to say, um, you know, I I was scouring some um, some interviews that you had done uh, as I was telling you um, off quote unquote air, and um, I know that uh, I think my first question for you um, is given your 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 background as a 
as a writer, I think what what first drew you to um, to becoming a writer? What was your what was your inciting incident, as it were? You see, I work in the lingo there. <laughs> yeah, no, you know, I, I think I think that the truth is that in my youth, I did not have a lot of uh, male role models that I admired. I grew up in a home with three brothers and my father and I had a difficult relationship. And I think I was just looking for who I was supposed to be. I mean, I was a um, a Jew who was a very devoted American. I mean, I was an all American kid uh, and I wasn't sure where that fit in. And I found the role models I was looking for in in tough guy American fiction, especially in detective fiction and in, in Raymond Chandler stories about Philip Marlowe and the Maltese Falcon by Dashiell Hammett and, and in, certainly in Ernest Hemingway's uh, stuff. And I, but it was especially it was especially Raymond Chandler and Philip Marlowe. He, he depicted this guy who was a, a knight. He carried the, the values of a knight into this urban corrupt setting. And I remember reading the very first page and thinking something to the effect of that's that's what I want to be. I want to be uncorrupt in, in a world that I know uh, to be corrupt. And that became a sort of model. And all of that uh, led on to my wanting to become a writer and from there to reading all kinds of literature because I wanted to see what what literature was made of. So that's really that really moved me uh it moved me certainly towards storytelling and ultimately toward crime writing. I thought, you know, that's so fascinating because, uh, you know, one of my recent conversations, uh, I, I, I spoke with um, an individual uh, uh, calling himself RJ Shaw, who has a YouTube channel, which is really great, um, called The Fourth Age. And um, he talks a lot about heroism and primarily in comic books. Um, but we, we had to talk about the sort of... Um, the breakdown or the or the deconstruction, if you will, or even the the straight up destruction of, the, of like the masculine heroine, uh, heroine, the masculine heroic um, ideal. And, uh, you know, I, I wrote down the word Chandler and next to it. I wrote I wrote Galahad because RJ mentioned uh, Sir Galahad and because we, we used um, we used Superman sort of as a launch pad for this discussion about like the, these classic um, heroic traits and how if we debase these notions uh, now, you know, we have an era where especially young men who need these kinds of examples, um, they, they just don't have them anymore. And so I think and then it creates a society where in good and evil, the lines are kind of blurred and it's like, no, some things are good and some things are bad. But uh, it, it seems um, it seems now, you know, I mentioned uh, I, I tweeted uh, weeks ago, you know, we live in this weird society where people who should be uh, celebrated are condemned and those who are condemned are the ones that should be celebrated. I like my chiasmus. Um, it's 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 very it's very interesting to hear that you that that was like sort of what um, pulled you out of uh, the difficulties that you were experiencing as, as a kid into the realm of story. And, and and also, I mean, it, absolutely true that going from uh, Chandler and The Sun Also Rises by Hemingway and The Maltese Falcon, I got into the idea of the quest uh, and, and the Holy Grail, and I started reading the Arthurian literature, and I just absolutely fell insanely in love with the stories of the round table when I was a kid. And that, right. in fact, led me to reading more and more into the culture and into Christianity, which was central in those stories. And uh, it really had a lot to do with forming my, my worldview. Well, it's interesting too because then I, I, you know, we talk about heroism, but then we, it was uh, in in a corrupt world. So, you know, my my question was like, why why are we so drawn to to crime and, and criminals? And and especially as an actor, I know it's always most fun to play the villain. I wonder what it is about us that just that that, that draws us to these darker aspects of uh, of ourselves. It's it's a really interesting question that I think about a lot, obviously, doing what I do. And and I think part of the answer, I mean, writers always come up with these self-serving answers, uh, not to condemn Stephen King. I think he's a wonderful, wonderful storyteller, but he will say things like, well, we all have these dogs inside our head and I take them out for a walk. I, you know, I bring the horror out into the open. But I think the actual fact is that our natural state is pretty ugly it's pretty bad and so it really is an act of restraint to be a decent person uh you know the idea that we should let it all hang out that we should be free that we should take off these uh you know uh, culturally uh, constructed um boundaries on our personalities is just the wrong way to go because when you do that you end up uh, just ripping each other apart so i think crime is basically a part of our nature and fighting crime is kind of what we're doing all the time uh you know the guy who solves somebody once said that a um that a mystery story is a tragedy with a happy ending. And I think that's what we're all kind of looking for. We're looking to take this kind of mess and uh, broken life that we lead inside, this interior life that we know is pretty awful, and turn it into something 
shiny and beautiful and uh, that we know we know it's supposed to be there and we know it's not and we're trying to get to it. You know, it makes me think about, um, you know, you, you mentioned restraint. I, I wrote down courage. It's, it's, and oftentimes it seems to be an act of courage to try to be good in, in a society that seems to be increasingly corrupt and it's such a struggle to do it. And uh, especially when it seems as though and I think this has been borne out time and time again, especially in the last few years, that uh, there seems to be a lot of incentive um, to do not so good stuff <laughs> so, yeah. to, to the point where you seem like kind of the odd person out to just kind of stand up and say, no, I'm not going to go along with this kind of thing. Uh, and this was this was always the way it was always, you know, we, it's funny. We see it in the movies. We read it in books. We see the guy who tells the truth, who pays the price. We see him called up. We see the bad guys hunting him down because he tells the truth or he's looking for the truth. But then when we realize that's the world we're look, we're actually living in, we're suddenly surprised. And I think part of that is because in America, for many, many years, there was an ethos that we were not going to be that way. And now we are involved in this in this terrible moment, this lost moment of people trying trying to impose a philosophy on reality that reality simply won't accept. And they, the strategy is if you can just tell the lie uh, five times in a row in capital letters on Twitter and make sure that no one else destroys that magical <laughs> lie by speaking the truth, uh, then the lie will become reality. And we know for a fact that doesn't work. There are a lot of bodies uh, stacked up to prove that it doesn't work. But boy, boy, oh boy, every generation, someone seems to try it again. And right now it's happening here. It seems that way. They're trying to impose an entirely different, uh, I guess, maybe grand meta narrative. It, it, it speaks to it's a nice segue to talk about the power of narrative and story. Um, you see, how, how can he? I, how that was great. I, yeah, I, no, I'm, I'm impressed. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, because I just um, I, I a big question for me, and uh, this has especially been um, a an inquiry of mine over the past couple of years. I, I just I just wonder why is it that we're we're so attracted to some stories and others that others we're not. Even on a popular level, um, I mean, I look at the Marvel the Marvel Cinematic Universe, for instance, and I and I fully confess and admit, I'm sorry, Mr. Scorsese, but uh, I really enjoy. Um, I mean, I'm someone who read comics as a kid. And I also fully acknowledge, you know, that I'm like, you know, the, the, the middle aged man enjoying all these people, these costumed heroes and, you know, pew pewing around and, and saving the world. But um, I, when I, I see that other franchises try to do try to replicate that success and they fail or I see stories, you know, I mean, a lot of my channel has been around, um, you know, I spoke to Victor Davis Hanson about the importance of Greek literature. Um, I'm a big I'm a big Shakespeare guy from an acting standpoint. I love Chekhov on um, these old, old works. And even in the comic um, arena right now, a lot of the best selling stories uh, are the older stories um, before the sort of um, infestation of this particular um, ideological um, um, worldview. And I, I guess, you know, and I think about the Bible as well. It's, you know, just th this book that's just endured for ages and ages and ages. So I guess the the unfair question I have for you, and I'll shut up for the rest of the, our time together if you want to answer it, is that, I mean, why, why do you think some stories just stick around and others kind of just fall to the wayside? That's, I mean, I just uh, can't so, figure it out. It's, it's a great question, and it's a really important question. And if I, you'll give me just a couple of minutes, I'll see if I can explain what I, what I think. Um, you know, let's, let's start with, with numbers. You know, if you think about the world as just a, a reality, a blank reality, uh, it's only the human imagination that comes up with numbers. You know, they, they don't make, you can, when you say this to a mathematician, they get very upset, but it's true. Numbers are an invention. There's no numbers in the universe. It's just it's something that happens in our heads. But when you use numbers, you can organize reality in ways that work. So in other words, they respond, even though they're imaginary, they respond to something real. I think the same thing is true of stories. Stories are a way of organizing what is essentially an empty, silent space, which is the human mind. It's not, it's not empty in the sense that there's nothing there, that there's no human nature. It's empty in the sense that there's no words in it. It's, the words are things that we supply. The characters, the stories are things that we supply. But if the stories are real, if they describe what's really there, like numbers when you use them rightly, uh, then they speak to us and they help us to organize our inner selves. And they help us to organize our inner selves toward what we want. Because each and every one of us knows, you know, there's not a single person on earth who does not know he is not the man or woman he's supposed to be. That there is something we have fallen short and we don't know exactly why, but in our minds there is this kind of image of, of the Andrew or the Clifton or whoever it is that it, we are supposed to be. And those stories help move us toward that, even through terror, even through uh, evil, even through images of uh, ugliness, they help move us towards that. And, and what 
our friends on the left are proposing basically is that they can reorganize those stories and create a different kind of human being. That's never worked. It's never going to work. Uh, you know, but but that's what they want to do. And that's why they censor things. One of the things I keep trying to explain to conservatives and conservatives can be very uh, Philistine uh, is is that if you look at the bestseller list, any conservative can put a book on the bestseller list, a nonfiction book on the bestseller list. You know, uh, Ben Shapiro writes terrific books and they get right on the bestseller list and the, the, the left has no problem with that. But you can barely publish a work of fiction in this country that is not left wing. They know where the battle is being fought. They know where the battle for the soul is being fought and it's fought in the arts and it's fought in the culture and it's fought in the stories we tell. And that's why, you know, James Joyce has a character says, say he wants to become an artist so he can forge the uncreated conscience of the race. Uh, and I think that it, it it's in stories that we find the path to the person that we know we're meant to be. And if those stories become distorted, if they become censored, if they become uh, rejiggered for political purposes, it just causes destruction and hurt. But it gives the people who want to sell those movements uh, hope that somehow they can construct a new person. Stories are important because they speak the human heart and they preserve information about the human heart so we don't have to learn it again same way a math textbook preserves formulas and ideas uh, that have already been proved since ancient greece we don't have to rediscover them because they're written down same thing is true with stories we don't have to rediscover what shakespeare knew uh, because we just can go back to shakespeare and it's all still true it's all still there you know, it's it's a very, very powerful thing uh, and a very real thing. And there's no civilization without it. And this fight that we're in right now uh, over free speech and uh, um, and and not censoring and not distorting everything to sell a, a certain kind of uh, politics is a very, very important fight. And I wish that uh, the right were as clever about fighting it and as aware, awake about fighting it as the left is. I mean, I've said that multiple times to different guests, as a matter of fact, I said, you know, it's it's my my big beef with the uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm not even sure what the right means anymore. But my big beef with, say, more conservative minded people tends to be, you know, it it's a very sort of heady intellectual space. They're focusing on economics and foreign policy and these kinds of things, which are which are, of course, very important. But they've sort of neglected. I mean, you know, the artists are these sort of weird frivolities, you know, of, of, of society and culture. But now they're now they, they complain, that, oh, look, the libs have taken over the arts. And I, you know, I recognize a part of it is, um, you know, just straight pragmatism. You know, it's hard to sustain a career in the arts. Uh, there's not a steady paycheck in it. How can you raise a family when you don't know when, you know, when your next uh, pay or your next meal is coming from? But at the same time, um, you know, I, it's I've been a little frustrated because, um, you know, I've you know, I'm one of few people who's who's been shouting out, you know, loud and clear, like, hey, you know, we this is really important. Stop overlooking it. And, um, you know, and people have pushed back on me. I say that the the art that a culture produces is a barometer of the health of the society. But some people have said, well, you know, also the reverse is true as well. Um, and it's 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 interesting because it also makes me think about um, what uh, what Thomas Sowell writes about the um, the our competing visions or, or the uh, the conflict of visions. And you would think that um, it would behoove, um, you would think more conservatives would be who I, who, I, who I looked at as embracing more the tragic vision of life. Um, they would be more interested in more storytelling because they understand that humans are flawed, that, that, that humans um, are, are not perfect and they're, they're prone to waste and, and uh, sin and licentiousness and all these kinds of things. But um, they just, it, it's just kind of escaped them. And so now, of course, everything has been commandeered by their ideological opponents. And uh, now I think we're seeing some of the ramifications of that today. Well, you know, the part that you said about the art being a bar barometer of the society is the part I think conservatives miss. They want to use the arts just like they use everything else for practical purposes. They want to preach things uh, to people through the arts, which, of course, makes for bad art. And as I always right. remind them, the people who founded this country weren't watching Doris Day movies. They were actually reading Greek tragedy and Shakespearean tragedy. And so they were looking at, at horrible things on stage, uh, you know, Medea killing her children and people putting out their eye, a guy's eyes on stage and King that's what yeah. they were looking at and that showed them what people were like and when you read the federalist papers and you see their their basically dark uh and cynical view of human nature uh when they talk about why we have to have all these checks and balances because people will do bad things given too much power that doesn't come from doris day movies and it doesn't come from watching g-rated films at all and what i find is that 
uh, the same people who will go to King Lear and watch a man's eyes put out on stage and will go uh, to, you know, a Greek tragedy and see people's heads chopped off and eyes put out and, and all the rest, uh, will write to me and say, well, you let this guy curse. You know, he said, uh, he, you know, he took the Lord's name in vain. And you say, yeah, well, he's a gangster. You know, that's the way they talk, you know. And, and so, uh, it, and I get this all the time. The letters that I love begin with, you call yourself a Christian. And I say, yes, I actually do. And this is what I'm here to do. You know, this is what my my job. And it they are stubborn about it. They will push back, you know, and especially uh, the religious people. Uh, they do not want to see what the world is like, even though that is the foundation of their religion, that the world is broken, that the world is sinful, uh, that everybody's heart has gone astray. And it, it is it's tremendously frustrating. And it is uh, frustrating that they panic. You know, part of being a conservative is seeing that if you pull a string you know, out of the suit, the whole suit will unravel. That's part of the mindset of conservatives. Right. So they think that, oh my gosh, if we lose the third congressional district in Ohio, all is lost. And therefore we must pour money into that election. But the arts, they can wait, you know, it's just a movie. It's just, what, what who cares, you know? Right. And and the, and the thing about that is, it, it is true in the moment, but it's not true over time. I was the De uh, mm. define it or describe it as when you're standing on the beach, you're standing at the edge of the water and the water comes in and you can feel it suck the sand out from under your feet. That's what the culture is like. And that is, this is a long uh, 60, 70 year struggle uh, that the left has gone through to take over the culture, not just to make sure that all the arts are left wing, but to make sure that none of the arts uh, is conservative. And that's the other part of this, the blacklisting, uh, the silencing, that there was just recently an article, I believe, in The Federalist uh, describing, you know, this small coterie of largely women uh, who run the publishing industry and will not allow uh, for a white male hero, uh, won't allow for. Yeah, I, I got I get um, in my books, I now have gotten they have what they call sensitivity readers and they'll say things to me. So help me. So help me. I'm not making this up. They'll say, well, you describe this woman as having coffee colored skin, but, you know, slaves used to have to harvest <laughs> coffee. And you go like, you know, I, I'm sorry. You know, you can't, you know, the word in, in publishing, the word stet means leave it as it is. And I can't write stet big enough in these things uh, to just get, get home my point. I actually had to tell one publisher to, to get rid of the copy editor uh, who was going over my books because I simply was not going to do any of these politically correct changes. But that's me who's ornery and uh, not just starting out and has had a career and knows what he's doing. If, if you're a young guy and you're desperate and you know what it's like in the arts to how desperately you want to do what you do and all this stuff, you know, it, it's very hard to withstand. And if uh, conservatives don't create their own venues, there will be no venues for conservatives because the left is not going to give an inch. You know, and it's interesting, too, because you mentioned, uh, I mean, you mentioned religion. And when, when I hear you, I mean, you know, I, I, I sent you a clip, actually, of uh, the young woman, Vesper Stamper, who wrote a book called Berliners yeah. recently. And um, she also mentioned in, in the midst of our conversation, these sensitivity readers. And to me, the only thing that I can think of is like the sort of the, the moral codes that we imposed on films, you know, back in the 50s. It's, it's so it's it's essentially um, it's it's one religion being swapped out for for another. And it's it's so bizarre because at the same time you have these people who who view themselves as secularists who are above religion and you know we don't want that in our story and and it's and it's violent and yada 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 and um on one hand it it you know we, we mentioned this before but uh, you know if you if you're cutting yourself off from the true raw ugliness of who humanity really is then you become ignorant not only just ignorant but small and these small-minded people are telling all these stories and have a, a outsized influence so then our culture becomes smaller as a result um but on top of that it just um I forgot what the second point was, because I'm so eager to talk about uh, you, you, you mentioned it so beautifully, because I want to talk about religion and your religious journey, um, because for me, um, I am uh, my listeners know, and I've said this over and over again, that I'm a, I'm a pretty atheistic fellow. Uh, I've been so for quite some time. I'm nowhere near as strident as I was about it before. And in the, in the past couple of years, um, I, watching how things have played out in society, um, I've said, you know, there's 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 a void going on there to the to the point where I give credence now to the to the idea that I hear conservatives mention a lot, which is the sort of God shaped hole in society, and, and I'm not entirely convinced that that's um, that that will be 
or, or, or the Christian God or whatever it is, is like the, the solution to all problems. But it does seem to be like there, there is something that's, that's missing. There's some kind of spiritual void there. And um, I happened upon an old interview that you gave um, with the Hoover Institution. And you mentioned that back in the day, you were pretty staunchly atheistic. And, uh, and um, I was wondering about um, how you came to that conclusion and how you transformed. I'll, I'll shut up for the next 10 minutes as you uh, <laughs> yeah, well, that so story. Well, it's a long story because I was baptized at the age of 49. So it took me a long time. And I wasn't a theist uh, until I was 45. Um, so I was most of that time, I would call myself an agnostic, but I was a functional atheist. I mean, God had no place in my life. And there was a period uh, when I became an atheist. And one of the great um, turnarounds I went through was I started when I dedicated myself to atheism, I started to read atheist works. And none of them made logical sense to me. I mean, the only leap of faith I ever took was that was to say, I can't prove that it is better to give a beggar bread than it is to torture a child. But I know this to be true. This is the axiom, this self-evident truth, that it is a good thing to give a beggar bread and it is a bad thing to torture a child. And that's the only leap of faith I ever made. And that off that uh, one little axiom, uh, it began to seem to me that in order for there to be anything that is better than anything else, there must be something that is better than everything else. Uh, and, and for something to be morally good, it has to have a consciousness. It can't, you know, a hurricane is neither morally good nor bad, uh, but a serial killer is bad. And so uh, I, that, that was kind of the logic uh, that I went through. And part of this was that the only time I ever read an atheist who made perfect sense, whose reasoning held together from beginning to end, was the Marquis de Sade, the guy from whom we get the word sadism, uh, who basically said, if, if nature is all there is, then let us act on our nature. Let, you know, we are cruel. Let's be cruel. Let's say it, it gives us pleasure to hurt one another. It gives us pleasure to commit rapes and to see the weak suffer. Let, let's do that. And I thought, yeah, that, that's right. That is that he's exactly right. If you do not take the leap of faith to say that's just bad, I can't prove that it's bad, but it's bad. If you don't take that leap of faith, the whole world is the Marquis de Stade. And so th there is no reason I would never believe in God simply because it was good for society. Uh, that's what a lot of people I know, people I respect, they say they're Christian atheists. They think Christianity uh, prov provides, the, provides the best uh, morality for society, but they just can't believe. They can't make that leap. I could, I could never say that. I, I don't care if it's good for society. I mean, I, I care, but I'm not going to believe in something that simply isn't true. What happened to me was I started to reason to the point where I thought, no, in order for there to be good and evil, and I can see with my heart and eyes that there is good and evil, there must be an ultimate good. There must be a God. And somewhere around this time in my late 20s, I went nuts. I went insane. I was in an absolute suicidal agony of despair. Hmm. And in that time, because I'm a stubborn uh, you know, coot, I basically said, well, I'm not going to believe in this even though it makes sense to me, because it would just be a crutch. I mean, I'm in so right. much pain, it would just be a way of like propping myself up. And so I didn't, I didn't believe in it. And uh, I, by what I now believe to actually be a miracle, uh, I, I found a psychiatrist who cured me. I'm the one person I've ever met who was cured by psychiatry, but he was a wonderful, brilliant man. And I loved him and he kind of re-raised me from my childhood up and, and, uh, and I've never, I've never else ever encountered anyone who went as crazy as I did, who became as sane as I became. I never mm -hmm. saw that. And so then in my, what followed, which was a period of success and joy and self-ease, I started to think, you know, that logic that I followed was actually right. You know, you, I can't avoid that logic. And almost accidentally in my 40s, I said a prayer one day, which I just didn't, it was not something I did. Uh, and it was a three word prayer. It was thank you, God, because I had just come through the fire. I had just come through hell, emotional hell, suicidal hell. And suddenly and everything was good, you know, all of a sudden, mm. uh, miraculously. And so I said, thank you. And that prayer changed everything. Mm. Suddenly I, things fell into place. And God is not something you can prove logically. As I say, you have to accept the axiom that there's good or bad, if nothing else. But you have to prove it as you prove spiritual things, the way I've proved that I love my wife over time. Over time, the experience of being with my wife has proved to myself and to her that I love her, that love is a real thing. It's not some kind of 
theory. It's not some kind of idea. It's not some kind of obligation. Uh, it is an actual extant thing, just like the number two describes something real. My love for my wife describes something real. The same thing is true of God. Ultimately, you have to experience it. And the experience of prayer over the course of uh, about five years so elevated and transformed my life that ultimately I sort of said to God, you know, all right, I, I get it. You're there. I, you know, I, I, I buy it. What am I, how am I supposed to respond to that? And that's what led me to Christianity. I mean, at that point, I realized that everything I was saying, every word I was saying was described in the Gospels. Uh, and it was mm -hmm. tough because, A, I was you know, a Jew. I was a secular Jew. Uh, I had been taught, as many Jews of my generation were and probably still are, that the Christians had, you know, there was that long history of anti-Semitism in Christianity, which is real and ugly, and that I would be joining the side of the enemy. Uh, I was told that it was a fantasy, which is the default setting of sophisticated society. When you do what we do, you live in coastal cities, you live among sophisticates, you don't live among the most learned people. Artists are, you, are often not the most learned people, but they are sophisticated people. They know there's no God. They they know right. uh, that. So, so it it's a real breakaway to leave your cohort and say, guys, I love you, but this makes more sense. And when you do it, you get happier and your life suddenly comes into view in a new and more realistic way. Uh, just to end, to, to finish off, I would say the one thing is, is as a very hard-boiled writer and as a hard-boiled person in a lot of ways, my one caveat was that if I become some fantasy, happy talk, yellow face with a big smile, Christian, I'll I'll go back. I'll stop. You know, and that that has never happened. The joy that you experience in God is a very realistic, down to earth, hard bitten joy that understands the world that you're in. Uh, it, it turns you into Philip Marlowe. It turns you into a man with a knight in his heart, walking through a corrupt world and knowing that he himself is corruptible. Uh, it's a very very realistic form of joy. Well, you know, it's you mentioned joy, and um, you know, it makes me it recalls to mind uh, the the little mini movie by um, the late Roger Scruton about uh, why beauty matters. And, uh, you, yes. you know, it's, it's like a, because that's sort of in many ways is what started me on this journey. Um, you know, because he talks about beauty and transcendence uh, specifically. Um, I spoke with another young woman uh, named Salome Sibonet, who's a wonderful writer, very, very fiery individual. And she talked about awe, um, A-W-E for those watching um, in, uh, in, in our art and how we're kind of missing a lot of that these days. And so I, I'd be, I you know, I want to get your thoughts on this as well. Um, in a society that appears to, you know, I don't know what the trends are on this right now, but it appears to me to be um, to be becoming like more and more secular. Um, I, I, I wonder, maybe it's too lofty and pretentious that maybe maybe perhaps the artists can step in and provide those sort of transcendental experiences that um, that um, religion can or used to um, in our society. And, and it makes me the last thing I'll say, to, you know, before I want to hear your thoughts is, uh, you know, I had this I was doing a show in D.C. Um, about 2010 or so, and I was, you know, really depressed and full of angst. And I mean, it was funny, just like you, I was like, you know, I'm not going to go down that route because it just I just be using God, um, <laughs> you know, for my own ends. But uh, I had this mentor who said, go to the museum. And I was like, well, I don't know why we're doing this and what, what the point is. I mean, I'm just doing plays. It's just so stupid. And he just goes, go to the museum, go to the museum, go to the museum. And uh, I went there and uh, into the National Gallery, which everyone should go. I mean, it's, it's completely free. You walk in there, some of the greatest works of art um, you'll ever see. And I walked, you know, these these wonderful paintings. And I remember going to the uh, the sculpture section. And I wish I could remember what the piece was, but it was a religious sculpture um, or a religious artifact. It was like 10 feet tall and just the level of detail and, and you know, and I remember standing, standing there just in awe looking at this thing and I began to cry. And all of a sudden I, I got it and I said, someone like 500 years ago built this thing and me, I'm standing here today in the 21st century looking at this thing, not even knowing quite why I'm moved, but all of a sudden I kind of knew what that what that power was. And I guess that the, the, the question I have or the, the, is, is do you think um, do artists have a role to play? I mean, is there a sort of link between the kind of maybe mystical or spiritual? And I don't mean to say those terms to denigrate. Um, I, mean, I know you know. I know you understand that. Um, yeah. But you know, I mean, is is there any credence to the idea that that artists can step in and and provide this sort of spiritual sucker that uh, that that religion uh, that religion could for or what, can for other people? 
Well, this was the whole point of the Romantic movement. I wrote a, a book about this called The Truth and Beauty. Uh, and the Romantic movement failed in a way because it did not, many of the people in it would not link it to the idea of God, but it actually makes no sense without that idea. This is the problem. Making sense is just really, really important. And when, when John Keats said that beauty is truth and truth beauty, what he was saying was not, oh, I find this pretty and therefore it's true. What he was saying is that beauty, you know beauty when you see it because it links to something, a truth that cannot be denied, something greater uh, than the truth that we see in front of us. The mm -hmm. best example, or at least the example that moves me most is, is Michelangelo. Angelo's Pieta. Uh, if you've ever seen it, it is one of the most remarkably uh, beautiful pieces of sculpture in the world. It, it lives up to its reputation. But when you think about it for a minute, it's actually a picture of the worst thing that can happen to anybody, namely the death of a child. And right. it is a picture uh, of a mother with her dead child on her lap. And on top of this, it is our God, and he is also uh, dead, the, the, this dead God. And yet the thing is fantastically beautiful. And you think, well, for something that horrible to strike us with such beauty, and again, beauty is like joy. It's not happiness. Beauty is not, oh, that's pretty. Uh, beauty is something really deep and rich and soul-centered that connects you to something. To a, It connects your soul to, a, I think, a bigger soul than yourself. Life could not be affirmed in a moment such as that by so much beauty if there were not something uh, to affirm it. The guy, the vandal who famously attacked the Pieta with a hammer, uh, said one of the best things any criminal has ever said. He said, I must destroy what other men cherish. And I, I heard that and I thought, yes, you must. Yes, you must. I mean, that is what it is. That is what, to, for lack of a better word, that is what the demonic is. It must destroy what other men cherish. But the fact that people cherish this picture of a mother mourning her child, the sculptor of a, a, a mother at the worst moment of anybody's life, uh, it, it, it affirms something greater than we can say. I mean, uh, our words for it, even our, our even our Bible description of it is just an image, an icon of it. Uh, it the, the reality of it is more than words and more than language. But in the moment of beauty, in the moment of encountering beauty, even the beauty of tragedy, uh, you you know it when you see it. And that's why, I mean, that's why King Lear to me is the Sistine Chapel of, of literature, because you see it and it is all death and all despair. And yet you walk out of there and think, uh, oh, my God, that was beautiful. You know? The first time I read that play <laughs> and the very end, I'm getting emotional. Think, you know, when Lear brings out Cordelia on stage. Oh, my, my Lord. Yeah. I mean, just face is raining. You know what I mean? Like you, you, you watch this. You, you've watched this entire journey of this of this <laughs> of this man. Everyone who tried to tell him the truth about what was going on was, you know, had dire consequences happened to them and then finally he's confronted with the consequences of like of his delusion i guess and um it's just so it's so stirring and so and so moving i'm not gonna i'm not gonna cry on camera unless i'm, <laughs> unless I'm getting paid to do it um so then i guess the follow-up i have is that since you're um since you're awakening i guess i'll call it um do you have has it do you think that it's uh, impacted or elevated your work in in any way? Has it suffused it with a with a, a certain kind of force that maybe it didn't have before? Oh, there's there's no. It has deepened it immeasurably. And the, the first thing is, is that almost all my early work, it's all you know. I'm a crime writer. I write what somebody once called neo Hitchcockian thrillers. I thought that was a fair description. Um, but but all of my work centered around the question. What is truth? The Pontius Pilate question. How can you know what is true? How can I say that this is this is not beautiful because I say it's beautiful? It is beautiful. And all my heroes in those old books uh, are uh, being, they think they've uncovered something dangerous. They think they've uncovered something uh, that threatens them, but they can never be sure if it's real or if they're imagining it. And that was to me the great question. Uh, how can you say that beauty is beauty? How can you say that truth is truth? Well, what's to stop people from saying, well, you know, you may you may have a penis, but you feel like a woman, so you're a woman. Why? What is the <laughs> objection to that? You know, why are you why are you objecting to that? Um, but in fact, you can. And, and it was not until I settled that question in my heart uh, that, yes, every philosophy has an axiom, a self-evident truth that itself cannot be proved. This is true of mathematics. This is true of philosophy. This is true of life. You start with a self-evident truth and you, that can't be proved, but that proves everything else and makes sense of everything else. But having said that, 
you can then say certain things are true. And, you know, it's a, it's a terrible thing about human beings that when they find something is true or good or beautiful, their first impulse is just to accuse somebody else of being false and bad and ugly and attack him. That's like, that's like the, you know, you give a human being a, the gift of light. And he immediately says, how can I turn this into darkness and kill people with it? But in fact, in fact, if you can resist that, uh, that, impulse to judge and to attack uh, and simply immerse yourself in the beauty of truth and the truth of beauty, uh, then then suddenly you start to live a, a, an elevated life. And so my my stuff, I mean, even I now sometimes look at my stuff and think, who wrote that, man? Because I, I don't, I, I'm, I am creating at a level beyond myself, I feel like mm. I'm, and I certainly feel that I'm doing the best work of my life. And all of that I attribute uh, to, to embracing something that's true. If I'm embracing something that was false, I wouldn't be doing that. I mean, I think I've embraced something uh, that is deeply, deeply true. You know, it's so fascinating because it makes me think about, um, and I mentioned this story before, but the, the great actress and teacher Uta Hagen uh, mentioned that uh, she had reached a point in her career, you know, she was working on Broadway, she was successful, but she had become reliant on all these kind of tricks. And um, she was taking no joy in her work. She was getting the applause and the reviews, but um, she, did, she, she just didn't care about it until she met Harold Clerman, who became her husband, the, the great director, and um, he sort of broke her down and and um, had her ap approach her work in, in a brand new way. And it was a work that was very rigorous, um, but really had more to do with tapping into the truth of one's uh, self and the truth of one's like authentic self. Um, she said that, you know, you don't, it, we often say that as actors, we get uh, lost in our roles, but that's not the truth. The, the better the better approach is to find yourself in the role. So, you know, so that way you, you distinguish yourself, you know, I, Clifton Duncan playing Othello, distinguish myself from Adrian Lester for, or from Avery Brooks or from uh, James Earl Jones playing the same role. And, you know, it just goes back to this idea of the fundamental truth. I mean, it's, it's uh, the, the more, the more she stripped everything away and, and the more she used her own sort of um, instrument to, to, in the service of these characters, then her whole career and her whole, her whole approach changed and her work deepened, as you said. And, um, you know, it, it, it also makes, it also, um, I was laughing at this idea that, uh, you know, we, we like to, um, we, we destroy the things that we love. Um, one might call it a, a strange habit of mind. Uh, that we... <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. I mean, when we're in the presence of a professional, I got to say. <laughs> I know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of mad at myself because I actually, I actually, so before we get there, so Strange yeah. Habit of Mine is a new book you have coming out. Uh, but yeah. This is why we're both laughing for those that are listening because the book is, is actually above uh, 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 Mr. Clavin's right shoulder right now. We're, we're going to get into it. Um, but uh, I, I did want to know if you had any sort of brief examples of how your work uh, deepened as a result of your, um, of your spiritual awakening, um, if you could provide, or if there's even a fair question to ask. Well, it, it's, it's simply that having, you know, when you're in that question of um of what is what is truth uh which is what hamlet is about i mean as hamlet i i believe is is uh shakespeare's prophetic uh play about the death of god this is a, a play about i mean that's mm -hmm. why that's why hamlet goes to college where luther put up his his theses is because he's basically saying oh the church is coming apart he prophecies that it's going to uh destroy faith i think and hamlet now not only can't find what the truth is, but he can't find himself. The first words of the play are who's there. Uh, and, right. uh, and and it ends with Hamlet being put on as a play. You know, Horatio saying if he had been put on, he would have made this wonderful and, play. And if I can jump in really quickly, like I, well, I think I think that when he when he's visited by the ghost of his father, I think he's such a heady character. And for me, I feel like that's a spiritual awakening for him. Like I don't think he's ever seen anything like that before. Right. You know. And, and that was a big question in the um, in the Protestant Revolution. How can there be ghosts? Or ghosts are real thing? And uh, and so he's basically uh, some a great critic. Stephen Greenblatt uh, said he's a, a very um, Pro Protestant man confronting a very Catholic ghost, essentially. Uh, and, and and you know that's a, that's a really interesting interpretation, which I think is absolutely true of the play. Um, but but once you start get past that, once you once you're that, there's no answer to that. You're in this circle forever, and Hamlet never really gets out of his circle, and you're just constantly in this maze of what is truth, who am I, who's there. Once you get past that, you're free. 
you're free to, to actually tell stories about life as it's lived, about life as you experience it. I don't have to say to myself, well, I, th I think I'm in love, but am I in love? No, I, I understand that you can, because you can love wrongly, you can get it wrong, you can get it right. And so things are real and not real. And that becomes a much more interesting issue, a much deeper, richer issue. And your characters just spring to life more quickly and more completely than if they're simply lost in this maze mm -hmm. of unknowing. And, and I think it also... You know, I flatter myself that I'm frequently before, right before the culture. Like I'll see something coming in the culture, a genre or something, and I'll think, oh yeah, that's the, the coming thing. And I flatter myself that this time too, this, this is a turnaround. We cannot continue at this level of self-doubt, uh, doubting even the genders of our children. I mean, that's simply, it's simply too destructive. Uh, and if we can't get out of that, then somebody else will do it for us and create a new society without us. You know? All right. So then, so then where does the character of Cameron Winter fit in to all of this for you? Cameron Winter is the protagonist, I believe, of A Strange Habit of Mind. Um, yeah. what, was the, what was the sort of inspiration and, and wellspring for Mr. Winter? Well, you couldn't you couldn't make this up. I mean, a friend of mine who is uh, named Otto Penzler, who is the, the greatest mystery editor in the world. He is, mm -hmm. there's no question about it. He called me up during the lockdowns, uh, during the pandemic lockdowns. And he was more, I was in California, I was fine, but he was uh, really locked down, he was in New York. And he said, would you be interested in writing a Christmas mystery for my, he has a publishing house. And I said, you know, it's funny. I have had a Christmas mystery in my mind for 30 years. And I know what the last scene is. And I've never been able to build the story to get to that last scene. And every time I've tried, it's just gone awry. I said, but I'll tell you what, give me a couple of days. And if I can work out the story that goes with that last scene, I'll do it. And I took these long walks. I, like I said, it was a lockdown. Nobody else was outside. And I was just taking these long, long walks. And at the end of the second walk, a, a little basically mystery writer's trick came to me. A mystery writer's idea came to me. And I thought, oh, yeah, that solves the problem. And so I invented this Christmas uh, mystery called When Christmas Comes. And Cameron Winter was the guy. What I always have done is created a, a character who makes the story come to life. If you put Othello in Hamlet, right, the play ends instantly. It's like avenge your, my father. Okay, you know, <laughs> well, you know, Othello, Othello doesn't have a lot of doubts. You know, you could use one or two more, and so and so. <laughs> you know, so so, or he has so, the wrong doubts, I should say. He has the wrong yeah. doubts at the wrong time. So, so I invent I invent these characters because they make the story complete. And that's what I did with Cameron Winter. And for the first time in my life, I said to myself, as I, I've never said this, this is a series character. I've written trilogies. I wrote the tetralogy once, but I always knew I wanted the story to end because the guy had a journey. And the, when the journey was over, the story was over. But the thing about Cameron Winter is he kind of represents the atmosphere in which that we're in. He doesn't represent it. He lives it. Uh, and he is a man. One, one of the things I've noticed about our culture is in the last upsurge of decent culture, which was the television uh, shows that grew up at around the 2000 to 2010, 2012, hmm. that all of those great stories, you have, uh, you know, you have The Shield, you have The Sopranos, you have Breaking Bad, all of them involve antiheroes. And there's a, a, a philosopher named Rene Girard who says when a culture is in its tragic phase, it can't produce heroes. It can only produce antiheroes. Right. And Cameron Winter has a very dark past, but he's a poetry professor. You know, he's basically a professor teaching poetry. And so he is an antihero who is trying to become a hero. He is looking for what it means to be a, a good man outside of the role that good men have in fighting evil what does it mean to just actually be a positive uh, force for creativity and beauty and love and and good and he's searching for that in a very difficult situation you know culture that opposes it and i thought wow that's a that's a whole series of books i could write that those books probably forever but at least for 10 books and so uh, I started the second one way before I knew that when Christmas comes it was did really well. It was a USA Today bestseller briefly, and it it really did well. Uh, and I I started the second one, A Strange Habit of Mind, which has just come out. It came out last week, I think. Um, and it, it it's about a guy who just has his strange habit of mind is that when certain acts of, of wickedness occur, certain acts of evil. They just get into his brain and he can't get them out until he can sort of let go of his own 
judgment and his own righteousness and his own opinions and just let them live in his in his mind almost meditatively and when he does that they start to fall into place and in this one he is uh, in a strange habit of mind he is battling a social media billionaire uh who has a habit of uh of canceling his opponents forever <laughs> so, <laughs> so from the very start winter says ha huh, i don't i don't think this is right and i have to do something about this and it becomes a kind of battle of wits between him and this very, very uh, brilliant and rich and powerful social media guy. And um, and yeah, no, I'm, I'm really thrilled with it. And I'm excited with it. You know, I'm kind of, you know, all things being equal, I'm in the last act of my career. And if I can go out uh, finishing this series, uh, uh, that would be a delight. You know. So then I have one of those questions where... Um... You know, like if you're uh, if you're doing a show and you have a talk back as the actor, there's always somebody who's like, how do you learn all the lines? And you're like, that's <laughs> like the most basic thing. But I guess yeah. my, my question for you, because it's sort of a story, uh, a structure question is that, um, is, you know, how, how, do, how do you normally build? Is it just an idea comes to you, a question or a theme you want to explore, a character, a scene, or is it all those kinds of things? It, it, it usually starts when I trace it back. When I, you, you can't always trace it back. Sometimes it's just there, you know? I mean, I can't remember the moment when I came up with the idea for when Christmas comes and all this, but, but it's usually the thought, uh, what would happen if, you know? I mean, uh, mm -hmm. the first really successful thriller I wrote was called Don't Say a Word. And it was, I, I had a, a, a baby daughter and because I was a nervous father, I'd wake up in the middle of the night and go in to make sure she was all right and look at her. And one day I was I was literally crossing the room to her little nursery and thought, what if she's just not there? <laughs> I look in and she's just gone, you know, and that was the idea of, uh, of don't say a word. That's what it literally what happens in don't say a word. And so it, it often starts with this kind of what if it's not always an anxiety. What if like that one? Sometimes it's a, a sort of a beautiful one, you know, like um, um, just the idea of like, what if this happened? But but it's hard to tell because sometimes you get if if you're a writer, people always say, where do you get your ideas? And the thing is, if you're a writer, you get ideas. That's what makes you a writer. Like you don't mm -hmm. you don't look for them. They just they just come to you. But I must get a hundred ideas at least for each one that works out. You know, and so you ask yourself these things and you think, you know, how, how many times have I said to my long suffering wife, you know, what if this happened or it was, was a cool place? What if somebody fell off that building? You know, and, and normally it just kind of goes away because once you sit down to write it out, you realize there's nothing there. But some of them just keep coming back. And as I say, a couple of them um, have come back to me for 30 years before I have had the wherewithal to turn them into stories. Uh, that's recently I, I wrote a um a, a short story that the Daily Wire published that had literally been in my mind since 1972. I mean, I'd literally had been thinking about it since 1972. And suddenly I thought, oh, I, wait a minute, I know exactly how to write that story. And so, and so it's a very, very strange process, but usually it starts with some kind of, just kind of impulse that this might be interesting if it happened this way. And yes, I love that. Uh, I guess my, my penultimate question for you is what I've been asking, um, a lot of my recent guests, um, especially if they're artists, is that what, you know, and we touched on this before about, um, you know, art and society, but what do you think now is the role of, of the artist in our society? Are, are, we, are we wasting our time? Um, is, is there something that we can do? What, what do you think um, is the role of artists and what do you think that uh, aspiring young artists should be focusing on right now? Uh, you know, I, I think it's a great question. And there's always with the arts, there's always this question of are, are we just wasting our time? Are we doing something silly? You know, why, why, why didn't I go to law school like my mom wanted? You know, that kind of thing. Uh, I think the opposite is true. I mean, I, I, I have been through the mill. You know, I've had great moments in my career, difficult, difficult moments. I was canceled in Hollywood. I mean, I, I took some big hits. Um, and and I even went through a period that would have been a midlife crisis, except I was kind of cool about it. And I just kind of let it happen where it all stopped having any meaning to me whatsoever. I just woke up one day and I said, you're telling stories about people who don't exist. You're telling stories that never happened to people who don't exist. What the, what the hell are you doing? You know, uh. and and through all of that, through all of that, I have had a deep, deep conviction that you are speaking into the human heart and the human heart is what life is all about. 
Uh, I mean, this is the thing that all these guys who sit around, they have grand schemes and they're going to fix everything and they're going to save the planet. This is the thing that they all forget. It really, really, the individual human heart is the only reason anything matters whatsoever. And once you get that, you start, first of all, once you get that, you start to understand what Jesus was talking about when he said, like, love your enemies. And you think, like, I don't even like my enemies. What, you know, it, what, what he was talking about is that that thing that is happening in you right this minute and the thing that is happening in me are both equally important and they're equally important to God and they actually are what this thing is about what this uh this journey of life is is about and that's what artists serve uh that is what artists serve I have been reading novels all my life and I know the impulse that comes over old men when you start to think you know why am I reading this this never happened I'm going to read a book of history and yet and yet novels continue to help me grow and change my perspective and give and people they people my soul with uh with characters that i can then grab hold of as parts of myself and understand better and uh the arts do that i'm i am uh, as i think i mentioned to you when you were on my show i'm a, a big fan of actors and when I, I i mean i love i love watching a great actor work i love watching actors work and what they do and when you see it it's kind of what you were talking about before that it's not so much that they vanish into the character is that they fill the character up with themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, the character is kind of this costume and they fill it up uh, with themselves. And when you see that, I don't know, it just torches something in your inner life. And, and, and by the way, you know, I think that the best of Christian religion is art, you know, that the, the, the mass is art. It is art that transforms bread and wine into body and blood. You know, these are things just like just like you transform uh, Othello into a living, breathing human being. Uh, and, and that and that's what each of us is trying to do in his way. I think the arts are more important than anything, but I think that they are, first of all, they're a tremendous risk. I mean, it's a, a real, really risky way to live. Um, and, and also, it's a little hard to define like everything else that matters, like love, like God, like the spirit, like all those things, you have to live it, you have to do it, and you have to experience it to know how much it matters. But when you meet people who truly love the arts, there is something about them uh, that's like just lit, it's just a little candle inside them, uh, you know, and and um, and uh, it, you understand then that this is a beautiful thing. Truth really is beauty, and beauty really is truth. And who was it? Was it Solzhenitsyn who said beauty will save the world? Or Dostoevsky, maybe. Be Dostoevsky, I think, said beauty will save the world. If anything saves the world, it will be beauty. You know, I can't think of a better way to uh, end our time together. Uh, Mr. Clavin, how can people find you? And uh, when is your book coming out? Where can they find it? My my book came out uh, last week. It's called A Strange Habit of Mind. And if if you can to tolerate Amazon, some people hate it, but if you can tolerate it, it really helps when you buy it there because it moves the rating up uh, and helps sell, sell more books. Um, but uh, that's A Strange Habit of Mind is there. You can hear me on Friday at The Daily Wire. I have a podcast there on Friday. And you can find, if you go on my website, andrewclavin.com, uh, K-L-A-V-A-N, um, uh, all my stuff is there and it will take you wherever you need to go. Well, Mr. Clavin, uh, I so appreciate you coming here today. I feel like we could talk for hours and hours and hours about no. a great many things, but as you know, in show business, we, we must always leave the audience wanting more. Um, <laughs> you know, thanks for stopping by and uh, I hope we get to do it again sometime. I hope so too. I'd love to buy a big sometime and talk, talk some more. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm.